All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am not supposed to be doing opening remarks. It's just I've got a big booming voice to get you all into your chairs, which seems to have been reasonably successful. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming this evening, and especially to our guest star tonight, John Greenwood. Thank you very much for coming, you guys. All right. All right. I am not emceeing tonight, and so I am not introducing Nick Saldo Smith. I'm just going to give him the microphone because he is our chairman and the man. Nick, all yours. Um, we, we need Andrew to get everyone sat down and make the works work, so he's now delivered his function for the evening. Um, it, it's my pleasure to welcome you all tonight, I'm glad we've got so many people in this room uh, for this event. Uh, I'm not going to say too much, and I'm not going to introduce John, Bill is going to do that in a minute. Uh, I want to do a bit of a promo for the Lion Rock uh, before we start. Uh, some of you come to our annual dinner, maybe all, maybe not all. But you do. I was there. Um, so I just want to go through what Lion Rock is doing at the moment, because it's changed a bit over the last couple of years. In terms of um, events and um, impact, uh, we have a big annual dinner in November with high-profile speakers, which is getting bigger and bigger every year. We have the occasional smaller dinner event like this one, when we have somebody who's got something interesting to say, uh, which is actually not often enough. So if you think of anyone who's going to be in Hong Kong and has something interesting to say that's relevant to free markets, then actually please let us know and we can try and organize something. We have a reading club every month where one of us as board members um, chooses a book uh, and we issue probably illegal PDFs of it to the people who are coming to the reading club and, and we talk for an hour and a half or something about the issues that are in the book. So obviously the idea of choosing the book is some aspect of freedom or free markets that can form a useful discussion. Um, as of last year, we started a, a student um, internship program of students going overseas from Hong Kong, funded by our sponsors, uh, sending students to free market think tanks elsewhere in the world, and three went last year to the US. We hope we may do five this year if we get funding for it. Uh, the idea being that if we can get 20, 21 year olds from Hong Kong to spend the summer thinking about freedom and free markets, then over time we end up having probably a bigger impact in Hong Kong uh, than simply some of us elderly members uh, writing stuff that nobody reads. Uh, so we hope to do more of that. Um, we also uh, do write things uh, on our website from time to time, um, and we're hoping to grow our membership board generally. Um, so if anyone in the room is not a member, and um, you probably know you're not a member, uh, then you probably ought to see Lawrence before you leave and make sure you become a member. Um, that would be much appreciated. Working out what the benefits of being a member as opposed to really being on the email list are is something I'll leave you, you to discover. Um, but there are discounts and there are early birds and stuff like that. But, but more than that, the reason we want people to become members and not simply receive the emails and never turn up is to try and find out how many people in Hong Kong do respond to the sort of things we talk about. Um, one would have hoped after 180 years of free markets in Hong Kong that people would actually think it was important. Uh, and if there are remarkably few people who live in Hong Kong that do think it's important anymore. So we need to get a feel for what the response is out there. And when we shout in the dark from the top of the lighthouse that nothing comes back other than the splashing of waves from the administration, it's a bit dispiriting. So, um, if you do think that the sorts of things that we talk about, uh, not going to talk about this evening, uh, are of interest to you, please become members, it's not extraordinarily expensive, so that we can get a feeling for how many people are interested in this sort of thing. Um, the last thing we're doing, of course, is trying to get more students involved, um, hence the sending the students abroad and having internships here because it tends to be the case that if you talk to anyone over 40 about these sorts of issues, they either agree with you and that's fine, or they don't and never will. But if you talk to a 20-year-old, um, despite a lot of evidence from the younger generation, actually they haven't made up their mind. 
think about stuff uh, in a way that people who are perhaps too mature don't want to do. Um, so that's a sort of background about what we're doing. Uh, try and help us do more. Um, you are now being served an appetizer, as you can tell, which we will eat. And after that, um, when the main course arrives, Bill will introduce uh, John Greenwood. Now, most people in the room either know John or know who he is. Of course, he's always called the father of the peg. And I was joking with Carmel that we're happy tonight that the mother of the peg is also present. <laughs> Whether they brought him with them to dinner. The mother of the peg. Mother of the peg. But fortunately, the peg is still alive and well in Hong Kong, even though John and Carmel have gone back to the UK. Uh, obviously, the, 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 their offspring, the peg, is now mature enough uh, to manage on his own here. Uh, anyway, we will hear on the subject of free trade, fair trade, or managed trade, which we thought was uh, particularly apposite at the moment following Brexit, that um, the world is full of assumptions that unless governments manage trade, it's a disaster, and the Brexit is, of course, about that. Uh, and, and for us living in Hong Kong, that seems to have worked quite well with free trade for 180 years, um, there's a nice link between uh, where John and Hong Kong live now and where they used to live from this background. Uh, that's enough from me. Uh, enjoy the rather small appetizer, still, uh, first, and then Bill Stacey will introduce John. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm obliged to speak for long enough for John to finish his dinner so that he'll be well fed um, and sufficiently nourished for the energetic presentation that I know he'll deliver for us. Um, John obviously has a um, very long connection to Hong Kong and, and it's a reflection of that that there are people at tables that have been diving with him um, in years past. Um, people that have worked for him um, in, in years past uh, and John's influence on Hong Kong um, has, has really been both at a personal level as well as an economic one, um, one that um, uh, makes us very grateful to see John, uh, have John here with us today and to, um, to host him and, and in typical um, sort of John fashion, not focusing on the parochial and, and the things around us but on um, a big picture issue about um, trade and, and the world taking our vision much more broadly. Um, as best I know John's history from the top of my head, um, he was uh, um, a, a key person in GT um, Asset Management in Hong Kong, which was a real pioneer in, in Asian um, asset management, really helped to um, develop equity markets in this part of the world. Everyone knows about the old brokers that are dead, um, you know, the, the Crosbys, um, firms that in, in, invested in um, Indonesian bus companies and are no longer with us. Um, but those companies wouldn't have been around if not for the customers, firms like GT, um, that, uh, that paid their brokerage but had a lot less profile, because at the end of the day, most of those firms actually made money for their customers and didn't go bust. Um, so, um, uh, so John's early work there was interesting from a professional perspective, but What's fascinating to me is the legacy he left doing all sorts of other things. So uh, when here in Hong Kong in those roles, John was publishing um, the uh, Asia Monetary Monitor, um, which you look back at, and, um, and with others in the room, he's uh, now some of those things have been republished so we can see articles from Asia Monetary Monitor. And as a um, sort of young, aspiring person interested in the economies of Asia back in Australia, looking for information about what was happening in this part of the world, how their economies worked, and um, what monetary policies were, what was different. There were very, very few sources. The Asia Monetary Monitor, which I found in the university library, um, was amazing. It, it had this deep insight about each of the countries in the region to a degree that was unique at the time, and even today would stack up very well if you were to line it up against the tens of thousands of papers that come out of the IMF and the World Bank every year, purportedly on the same issues, but often with a lot less insight. And so John's legacy in this part of the world was really critical in developing understanding of um, the economies throughout Asia, 
and more importantly, training people who did understand. So I think John's contribution to the financial infrastructure of Hong Kong, but the broader region, um, was really seminal in helping people to um, uh, appreciate the richness of, of, of this part of the world, but also to understand it in its own terms rather than just um, you know, pick up papers that were published in uh, Washington or London and, and assume that they apply it here, to really understand what was done um, and the impacts of those incentives. And the reason John did such a good job there was partly because he's a very fine economist um, but also because of his um, yeah, interest in this part of the world, engagement in this part of the world, um, and, and with people. So that's telling, many people will know that, but, but John's actually much more famous for um, his contribution to the formation of the linked exchange rate. Um, uh, many people are familiar with that, I won't go into that in detail but um, to be known as the father of the peg is quite an achievement. But not only that, he's um, still on um, you know, the advisory committee of the, um, uh, uh, the, that looks after the supervision of, of, the, um, of the exchange rate and is still involved um, in Hong Kong's monetary system. And, uh, and to the extent that we've had um, stability and prosperity in, in Hong Kong over a long period of time, um, we should be grateful to, to John's contributions. Um, for a long time though, John's been working at Invesco and one of the things that really is interesting about John as an economist is that wonderful mix of an engagement in actual markets and actual businesses and real companies but also a thorough understanding of, of the theory, um, uh, the fundamentals and the economic side and, and I think the ability um, that John's had at Invesco and, and we're an occasional client of Invesco and an occasional reader of their material but relish it when I read it from John um, his ability to communicate to um, investors to, to work with both retail investors to help them understand um, as well as the, the professionals in, in his firm you know, is continuing to make a, a very broad contribution. So I always find John very insightful on almost any subject that he's talking about, whether it's the history um, of, of Hong Kong, whether it's this part of the region, or whether it's um, global economics and what's going to happen to um, uh, bond yields tomorrow. Um, you know, John's ability to syn synthesize an enormous amount of information, bring it together into an elegant and simple understanding that cuts through a lot of, um, uh, a lot of noise um, is very refreshing in these days. I think I've almost successfully spoken for long enough to um, let John finish his dinner. Um, I would just say, though, that the topic that we're talking about um, around um, trade is, is of particular importance um, uh, today. Um, you know, people are uh, happy to consume goods and services without much thought about how they come to us. Um, and the threats that there are within the, the global trading system, that happening effectively, efficiently, um, and in a way that continues to produce the prosperity that trade has done over a long period of time are very real. And John's insights about that, um, we welcome. So John, thank you very much. I say after all of that and very flattering uh, introduction. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, in a sense, I'm out of my depth. Normally, I talk about uh, the business cycle, money and credit, and that sort of thing. I don't often talk about things like trade. So he's really set me up for failure this evening. Uh, I hope that um, I'm not going to disappoint you. Um, I'm going to try to cover some of the broad aspects of how trade is conducted and, and regulated uh, in the world today. Um, but I want to focus, as I was requested to do, particularly on services. Because not only Hong Kong, but the UK, where I come from, and many other countries <coughs> are rapidly becoming more and more service oriented and the way in which services are handled and regulated in the international trade system is a little different from uh, what happens with, with goods and it's important to, to understand that. So I'm going to start off with the importance of services, I'll then talk a little bit about the uh, 
the structure of regulation of global trade. I then talk more about services versus goods uh, and how they differ, and then try and say something about the outlook and the prospects <coughs> for service-oriented economies, and particularly the UK and its negotiations with the EU and Hong Kong. So that's the agenda I've set. Um, I have to apologize in advance that uh, you know, I don't have lots of um, exciting pictures and diagrams to show you, which is really what you want in an after dinner, from an after dinner speaker. Uh, but it's, it's, I'm sure Merle has a few jokes about uh, trade, but <laughs> um, it's difficult to find them in the literature. So, <laughs> services have a uh, major role to play nowadays. Historically, what we've seen in most economies is a, an evolution from agriculture to manufacturing and then more and more to services. Obviously, services in a sense start in the household and continue all the way through um, the economy. There are services associated with agriculture, there are services associated with manufacturing. But as countries become richer and as productivity increases, the number of people you need to provide the food that people need, uh, the number of people that you need working in factories, uh, all of these diminish. And more and more people are engaged in services. And more and more of uh, the output of major economies uh, is comprised of services. Uh, some official figures I've found suggested that services account for over 60% of global production and employment. Now that includes countries like India and China and you know, other emerging markets where manufacturing and agriculture are still very dominant. Uh, but by contrast, uh, services account for only about 20% of total global trade. So. It's still a small area of the trading environment, but we shouldn't underestimate that it's growing very rapidly, particularly because many services, long considered domestic activities, have increasingly become internationally mobile. <clears throat> so for example, we've got new transmission technologies which enable you to conduct your electronic banking in a completely different country, to do telehealthy examinations, to learn uh, over the, the internet. Uh, it's also true that long entrenched monopolies, such as uh, telephone systems and postal services are now being undercut and eroded by these new electronic transmission mechanisms and uh, new deliveries, the delivery systems, and the, the deregulation of that uh, has obviously helped. Uh, and some areas such as transportation, which historically were tightly regulated, um, have opened up. They may still be tightly regulated, but they're, they're, they've opened up. So services are becoming more and more important. Uh, and if you combine that with changing consumer preferences, uh, such technical and regulatory innovations have, I would say, enhanced the tradability of services. And that's going to be an important uh, theme or thesis, uh, theme of world trade going forward. Mr. Dami, can you hear me clearly through the mic? Okay. <clears throat> um, so, let's talk about the trade in services versus the trade in goods. Um, obviously, unlike trade in goods, where you're physically shipping something from one place to another and across a border, trade in services is really rarely affected by tariffs. Um, in the old days, it's easy still is, uh, to impose a tariff at a border and require a duty to be paid. But that 
doesn't, it's not easy to apply in the service area. And services in any case can be significantly affected by non-tariff barriers, NTBs. So we have to be prepared for lots of non-tariff type restrictions in the service area from countries that don't want to, co to compete or don't want to allow their services to be undercut. So non-tariff barriers include, for example, restrictions on the ability of a service provider to establish itself or operate in a different country, requirements for service providers to possess certain qualifications, licensing for professions or um, a variety of other occupations before being allowed to provide the service. Uh, this reduction in the use of tariffs in goods has perhaps increased the relative importance of non-tariff barriers in the service area. I think that these non-tariff barriers are on the whole harder to eliminate due to vested interests and due to differing legal systems. That's really the sort of core problem uh, which we will come back to. <clears throat> now before I go any further, let me give those of you who are not familiar with this area a little bit of a, an overview of the way in which global trade is regulated. Um, after the war in 1947, an organization was set up called, well, it wasn't an organization, an agreement was set up called the GATT, the uh, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Uh, which was far-sighted, took effect in January 1947, and basically until 1995 it was the dominant uh, uh, organization that uh, managed or took responsibility for liberalization of trade. And there were a whole series of gap rounds to liberalize trade in goods in a number of areas. But it, gradually it became apparent that services were also very important. And after uh, 1995, when uh, the, the World Trade Organization was set up, it was decided that GATT would look after trade in goods only, and a separate, like a parallel organization called uh, the General Agreement on Trade and Services was set up. Uh, and all World Trade Organization members uh, became so, ipso facto members of uh, GATS. Uh, and the GATS uh, system of regulating services or over overseeing services applies to all services except two which I'll mention in just a moment. And then there are other functions under the, the WTO uh, such as TRIPS. Does everybody know what TRIPS are? In um, this game, there's all kinds of acronyms that you have to get used to. Um, TRIPS are, any volunteers? Intellectual property? No. Well, they are, but they are trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. <laughs> what about GPAs? No bids. Uh, government procurement agreements. Uh, now, on the tariff side, over on the GATT side of this diagram, uh, progress has been pretty good. In 1947, it's estimated that tariffs on average were about 22%. By 1994, after the Uruguay round, they'd come down to below 5%. Uh, and in some areas, obviously, they are eliminated altogether. Uh, but they still exist. Um, and as I said, GAP is, was really just a set of rules and agreement. It didn't have uh, what the WTO has now, which is an institutional setup, a physical headquarters, staff, delegations, etc., etc. The whole, uh, the whole bang shoe. Um, so that's kind of. And I've 
I've highlighted the central box because central box, that's what we're primarily going to be talking about. And of course, what I didn't, didn't mention, sorry, ever on the right, <coughs> is that an important function of the WTO is dispute resolution. Um, and I'm sure we will be hearing quite a bit about that as um, relations between the US and China develop under Mr. Trump. So coming back to gas in the services box, in principle, as I said, all services are covered, but there are two major exemptions. And they are, first, services supplied in the exercise of government authority. So things like social security, health, education, which are supplied domestically by a government. You don't have to sort of meet global requirements on those. Obviously, you have your domestic requirements. And often those are provided under non-market conditions. Uh, health may be provided for free. Social security may be against some contribution or not against any contribution. Education, similarly. So, uh, government provided services are not subject to GATS. And the other area of exception is air transport services. And this is very relevant in the case of the UK applying to uh, exit uh, the EU. Um, because, obviously, it would be a major problem if all the planes suddenly stopped flying into London or British planes were unable to fly to the continent. So this is an area which is um, at least uh, exempt. But um, more generally, the problem with services is that obviously there are services which are sold across borders. But there are lots of other services which are in effect international, internationally traded services where it, it's not quite so obvious that they are traded across borders. But the lawyers have been at this topic for quite a long time now, <clears throat> and they've defined the following additional three areas as important. First of all, consumption abroad. So if you go abroad and you eat, drink, and um, stay in hotel rooms, you are you're a tourist and you are consuming abroad. That's a service sold to a foreign tourism. Um, third, commercial presence. Uh, it's very difficult for a foreign entity to sell something in a country and in, in many industries unless it has commercial presence. Uh, so it's important, as we'll see, that that commercial presence is not subject to too many restrictions. And then, finally, the presence of nat natural, natural persons. So if I'm a, a Brit and I happen to speak uh, enough French or Spanish to get by, I could go and live in France or Spain and teach English. I would be, I might be remitting that money back to the UK, uh, but the, my presence in that foreign country uh, is in effect creating a service or selling a service which may be related to the country that I come from. So these are sort of areas that the GATS part of the WTO looks at, monitors, and uh, tries to regulate uh, where it's appropriate to do that. Um, I could say more about the detail there if it interested you, but um, maybe I think that's enough. It's just to say that services are not only things that are traded across borders. or intangibles. Uh, now there are a number of key GATS concepts that we have to get to grips with. Um, market access, uh, under when a, when a country becomes a member of the WTO and uh, also GATS, uh, it um, 
has to offer market access to foreign entities uh, on a non-discriminatory basis. There's also the famous uh, MFN rule, uh, most favored nation rule, which says that if a country offers uh, a low tariff to one country, it has to offer that same low tariff to all other countries. It cannot discriminate. So it has to trade, um, it has to treat all countries equally. Um, similarly, countries have to uh, adhere to what is called national treatment. That means treating foreigners and locals equally. You can't discriminate against foreigners who are trying to sell your service. Um, maybe what I should have also said about market access is that there are requirements on member countries to make information about their industries and what, what you need to do to be able to sell services in country X or country Y accessible. You can't hide the details you know, so that foreigners just can't do the, do the business. You, you, and, and those kinds of things all have to be disclosed and many of them are readily available on the WTO website. Um, it's a basic tenet of the WTO and particularly GATS that there will be progressive liberalization. Um, now that's rather stalled in recent years. There was a whole series of tra trade liberalization rounds tackling different to topics until the Doha round, which started in 2001 and was finally abandoned in 2015. Basically, it started out with the idea that they would tackle agricultural subsidies and uh, services in developed country, in developing countries. And the idea was that the developed countries would open up their agricultural sectors to the emerging markets and you know, Africa and Latin America and Asia would sell lots of uh, cheap food into Europe and North America and Japan uh, and conversely these rich countries would be able to set up service industries, particularly financial service industries, in all the emerging countries. Well, needless to say, that went nowhere. Uh, there was huge resistance uh, from agricultural lobbies in the developed countries and huge resistance from the service and financial lobbies in the emerging countries. So things have really stalled. And because of that perception, for the last decade, in knowledge, sort of in the certain view that that was going to fail, we've seen the development of a lot of bilateral and regional trade agreements. That's why we're starting to see them, because this multilateral global trading system seems to have kind of hit the wall. It's, it's not been possible to push things further along. From an economic point of view, that's not necessarily a good thing. In economic theory, there is a theory of um, trade creation and trade diversion. Uh, to the two sort of ideas in this area. Um, trade creation really implies that if two countries specialize in what they're good at, that will increase the volume of activity for both countries, and everybody will benefit from that. Trade diversion occurs when two countries make an agreement, but that agreement ignores what's happening in the rest of the world. I'll give you a, a well-known example of that, and that is between Australia and New Zealand. They have a trade agreement and when they implemented that trade agreement, they continued to prevent white goods, fridges, cookers, and so on, from being sold uh, from abroad. So there, were, and there was a small New Zealand company, which 
many of you probably know, called Fisher and Paykel, which for which this trade agreement was a bonanza because suddenly they were able to sell their cookers and fridges <coughs> all over Australia. A big market had opened up for them. But from an Australian's point of view, and indeed from a New Zealander's point of view, the right thing to have done would have been to eliminate the tariffs and uh, quotas and protection altogether and enable consumers to buy cheap Japanese or Taiwanese or nowadays Chinese white goods. And this really highlights the key issue at the bottom of all these trade problems. And that is that most of the trade negotiations proceed in the name of and in the interests of producers, not in the interests of consumers. And we'll see that when we come to discuss Brexit. There's a hugely strong case for Brexit. If you're a consumer, the problem is that it's the, the lobbyists are the producers and they're dominating the negotiating, the negotiating strategy of the government because the government is terrified about loss of jobs in particular companies. And so we have this sort of perpetual war between producers and consumers and as is often the case, producers tend to win out because their uh, lobbying power is greater and more focused, whereas consumers who have a, a, an important interest in this tend to lose out. Final bullet point on this slide is uh, the built-in agenda. Um, when countries join the um, WTO or the, uh, the GATT, the GATS. Um, there was a, from the mid 90s, there was a, an agenda that they were going to progressively try to liberalize and um, not harmonize necessarily, but at least um, focus on improving trading conditions in a whole range of industries. I'll just list you some of these. So sanitary and phytosanitary measures, technical barriers to trade, dispute settlement understanding, uh, government procurement, um, agriculture, um, intellectual property rights, investment measures. That's, an, that's another um, acronym, TRIMS. Uh, textile and clothing, textiles and clothing, and so on. Uh, you know, all of this was done with very good intentions. But as I say, what's happened in the end is the producers who got hold of this, they, you know, they're lobbying their uh, spokesmen from their governments not to liberalize too much because that will threaten the companies in the home country. So that's a little bit about the sort of structure. Just one more thing on the structure, and that is you've heard of these things called free trade agreements. And indeed, in her speech at Lancaster House last January, uh, the Prime Minister, um, Theresa May, said she wanted a free trade agreement with Europe. So how, the question is, how do the free trade agreements fit in with WTO rules? FTAs, as they're called, are a key exception to MFN. MFN, you remember, is provide the same benefit to every country. Provide, if you provide only a 5% tariff to country A, then all the other countries, B through Z, or 150 other countries, must all also have the same tariff. But the WTO specifically allows members who have the, gives them the right to depart from the MFN principle in order to enter into an, MF, into an FTA, provided that in relation to services, and that's the area I'm focusing on, the FTA first has substantial sector coverage. So you can't say, well, we'll have an FTA, but only in um, insurance. It's got to be across, pretty much across the board. Second, the FTA has to ensure the absence or elimination 
of substantially all discrimination between or among the parties at the start of the agreement and in a reasonable time frame. So, you know, you've got to show intent that you're going to move this agenda forward. Importantly, the FTA should not also result in new trade barriers for other uh, WTO members. So you can't say, well, we're going to have our club and then keep everybody out and raise the barriers against them. You can maintain the same barriers, but you can't raise them. Uh, and then, uh, and, and these agreements you know, are applied to interim or transitional arrange agreements. Okay, so when a country becomes a member of WTO and GATS, it undertakes certain obligations. We've already talked about MFM. Uh, transparency is that making available the information necessary to operate in that industry. That's, uh, again, fairly straightforward. Uh, and the WTO requires uh, countries to make specific commitments in relation to market access and, and national treatment. This is repeating it to a degree what I've already said. Uh, however, there are, and this is where it starts to get complicated, um, quite a few exemptions. And um, members can, in specified circumstances, introduce or maintain measures in contravention of their obligations under the agreement. So you can do exactly the opposite, including against the MFN principle or specific com commitments for certain reasons. For the protection of public morals. Now the problem here is you could keep out film industry. You could keep out you know, public publications because you could argue that these things were going to undermine public morals. This is the danger. Um, you can argue that you're going to protect human, animal, or plant life. We can't have any of these products in because you know, they would bring bugs in which would uh, eliminate or outcompete our local bugs. <laughs> That sort of thing. It's easy to have restrictions of that kind, which, in effect, um, amount to a trade barrier. Uh, another exception is that you can set up arrangements which secure compliance with laws or regulations in your own country, like preventing fraud. But then, of course, the Japanese and the French and others have become very good at examining in minute detail uh, shipments of goods, but they can apply the same to services and say, no, no, this doesn't meet our requirements. Uh, you can also impose restrictions for prudential reasons, for depositor or investor protection. Oh, we want safe markets. But, you know, how far do these things go? Or how far do you allow those things to go? And finally, balance of payments protection. We've got a balance of payments problem, Therefore, we seek exemption from the commitments we've undertaken. So this is a kind of very grey area where lots of things get muddied. And um, uh, part of the reason the process has sort of come to a, a grinding halt, the process of liberalisation, is that these things have become more important in the public psyche in many different countries. Okay, now I'm going to switch to Brexit and then Hong Kong. <clears throat> so we're getting near the end, those of you who are anxious about your, your stamina. Um, in the UK, services account for at least 70% of UK output and 40% of exports. Roughly speaking, um, manufacturing is about 14% of the GDP, and then we have a certain amount of mining and offshore drilling and activities of that kind and construction, which are not manufacturing. Uh, and then we have a, a sort of residual 2% in agriculture, and the rest pretty much is all services. Uh, in Hong Kong, you probably know, we'll come to that figure, but it's 90%. <clears throat> Britain currently has a, a trade surplus in services with the EU of the order of $15 billion per annum. Uh, currently we trade in services with the EU under the single market rules. 
So we are part of the EU. For the rest of the world, we trade, or Britain trades with the rest of the world. Um, through whatever EU agreements there are, FTAs, or through WTO arrangements. The EU is a member of the WTO. Britain, through its membership of the EU, is a member of the WTO, is a founding member of the WTO. So we currently trade with the rest of the world, the US, Japan, um, Hong Kong for that matter, Australia, Canada, etc., under these EU uh, arrangements, and where we don't, we trade under WTO arrangements. Now, in Europe, the Customs Union for Goods, as you know, was set, set up in 1958, but the service sector wasn't really brought under regulatory uh, supervision and uh, trade control uh, until much later. Uh, and it wasn't until 2006 that a very lengthy Brussels document called the Services Directive, Directive was issued. So today, the Office of National Statistics in the UK estimates that only one-fifth of services provided in the EU actually crosses member state borders. So that's in line with the figure I gave you at the beginning, that trade-in services are still uh, the junior brother, uh, but as I've indicated, it's probably growing, going to grow pretty rapidly <clears throat> if it's allowed to. Um, so, the area that you'll all be interested in, I suppose, is uh, what does Brexit mean for UK financial services? Now, here again, complications come crowding in. It's often said the single market is pretty incomplete in the area of services. And what that means is that the EU, the collective of the European nations, hasn't taken control of services. And that competency, as it's called, is still left with individual countries. And this has obvious implications because it, what it means is that, first of all, the EU can only act in areas where it has exclusive confidence, competence, such as setting the common external tariffs for the customs union. But conversely, it means that from the UK's point of view, in order to get a deal on services, it may have to traipse around every individual country of the EU to get agreement, which is going to be tedious in the extreme. Um, under the EU's current FTA, free trade agreements, there is very little agreement on liberalisation of services. The most recent one they did was with Canada, the Canada-Europe Trade Agreement. That outlaws overt discrimination against foreign ownership, yes, but it does very little to deal with lower level barriers such as country-specific regulations in the service area. So this is going to be a big hurdle for UK negotiators. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but here are some of the numbers. Um, <clears throat> this is Britain's trade in services with the EU. We're exporting about uh, 80 billion, 85 billion a year. We're importing uh, something, like, something like 70 billion a year. And the trade, we've got that, that surplus with the EU. And that surplus is very important in the balance of payments because it means that <clears throat> we can run a big trade deficit in goods, that's the dark blue line, but it's considerably offset by the surpluses in services, so the overall uh, trade balance in goods and services uh, is only marginally negative. So much for the UK, um, we can talk about that more in Q&A. Uh, what about Hong Kong? Hong Kong, as you know, follows a free trade policy and hence maintains, or has maintained, uh, really ever since the start, basically no barriers to trade. Uh, so there are no customs tariffs on goods imported or into or exported from Hong Kong. Uh, licensing is kept to a minimum. 
most products don't need licenses to enter or leave, leave Hong Kong, um, and uh, where those licenses or, or notifications are required, they're only intended allegedly to fulfill obligations under various international undertakings or to apply for public health, safety, or security reasons. Uh, the Trade Industry Department, uh, as you know, is responsible for the regulating of this area, and Hong Kong has is a still a trade a member in its own right under Chinese sovereignty, uh, Hong Kong China, uh, of the WTO, uh, APEC, the OECD, uh, the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council, and various other organisations of that kind. <coughs> Mainly Hong Kong's most important trade agreement is CEPA, the uh, agreement with China, uh, which was concluded in 2003, and since then 10 supplements have been signed, um, or at least between 2004 and 2013. Currently, all products of Hong Kong origin, except for a few prohibited, art prohibited articles, can be imported into the mainland tariff-free. But of course, we don't make very many things that have a Hong Kong origin anymore. Most things are imported from somewhere else, um, and there may well be restrictions on those. Um, Hong Kong service suppliers enjoy preferential treatment under SEPA in entering into the mainland market in various service areas. Uh, and there are also agreements or arrangements on mutual recognition of professional qualifications. Uh, in December 2014, the agreement between mainland and Hong Kong on achieving basic liberalization of trade in services in Guangdong, the Guangdong Agreement, was signed uh, within the SEPA framework. And so we now have you know, some sort of a trade agreement going in services with Guangdong. Um, I won't elaborate on that, but you know, that's clearly very important since Hong Kong is obviously a huge trade partner of Hong Kong. <clears throat> um, just last year, the investment agreement and the agreement on economic and technical cooperation, the Ecotech agreement, were signed also, also under SEPA. And in addition to SEPA, Hong Kong has a number of FTAs with New Zealand, um, the European Free Trade Association, which is Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, and Sweden, Switzerland. Uh, Chile, Macau, uh, and ASEAN. Uh, there are various other negotiations underway, but um, none of them very uh, except Australia. <coughs> so um, that's kind of Hong Kong's structure uh, in this framework that I've described. And <coughs> here are the data for Hong Kong, uh, rather like the UK data. Uh, this is Hong Kong's trade in total trade in services. Um, and this includes financial services. The problem with financial services is that it's very difficult to attribute them to particular countries. And so we only have country by country data for various subcategories of trade in services, things like professional business services or digital trade or um, that sort of thing. So in Hong Kong, Services account for over 90% of GDP. Uh, they include financial services, professional business services, so that's legal, accounting, all that sort of thing, travel, transport, uh, digital, which is telecommunications, etc., creative services, and a few others. <clears throat> Hong Kong is the sixth largest exporter of merchandise trade, the 15th largest exporter of commercial services. So we're still way ahead in trade, but that's because of the, the re-export re business. Uh, and uh, the commercial services are going to become more and more important going forward. Clearly, Hong Kong needs to sort of overcome some of the barriers to trade agreements and services, because Hong Kong is the most important entrepot for the Chinese main mainland. Uh, it's the largest investment source for the mainland. And the um, and it's also the key capital raising centre for Chinese enterprises. Mm. Conversely, the Chinese mainland is Hong Kong's largest source of external investment. So the, the interrelation between the two is huge. 
and it's important that Hong Kong should be able over time you know, <coughs> to expand its service activity. Um, that's kind of what I wanted to cover and what I wanted to say. I realize that I've left out a lot uh, on the EU negotiations of the UK. Um, I haven't even mentioned passporting, for example, uh, but we can cover those sort of things in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Just while everyone's thinking, uh, John, you mentioned early on in your remarks that it's obviously much more difficult to measure services than it is boxes. So when we get presented by the Office of National Statistics and everything else, all these relatively precise numbers about services imported and exported, in the economist profession, what level of credence do you give to the accuracy of what's actually going on in the real world from that point of view? Well, globally, um, most industries are classified pretty clearly. And that classification enables you to define manufacturing from services from agriculture. <coughs> However, of course, within a manufacturing company, no. There are people who are doing finance, or HR, or legal services. They are really a service appendage per manufacturing company. But nevertheless, the convention is that we treat all of those people as part of the manufacturing industry because it's integrally related to the, the product, the, the production of those boxes. So I, I, don't th I don't think the figures are at all bad. I mean, you can add up the GDP in several different ways. Um, obviously, the expenditure, value added, income, um, uh, and those are, you, know, you can sort of match those up uh, and you can get reasonably good numbers. So, I, I don't think the service figures themselves are too inaccurate. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you also for that um, incisive presentation. Uh, a question, a comment, and then a restatement question. Uh, the question is, where will we be 10 years from now on the evidence of what you presented this evening? The comment is, what you've said is familiar to many of us. Um, the desperation over the future of the WTO, for example, uh, was openly admitted at a high-level meeting with the WTO a few days ago, uh, where they said, well, FTA is the way forward. Um, my comment at the time was that what's happened to Doha, you know, have we given up on all that? The answer to my surprise was yes, we have. We're entering a new Westphalian world, was the actual comment. That being the case, um, the sort of issues that you've highlighted that are positive, for example, SIPA for Hong Kong, when you set them against what you see what's happening in Europe, in Russia, in China, in Japan, in India, and so on, the rise of protectionism and all these other real cliches, that's the comment. So coming back to the question again, what should we, as a business community, do about it, or can indeed we do anything about it as a city which, more than a country which has a large internal economy and therefore perhaps can afford to be a bit flaccid about these philosophical issues, lives by trade alone? But I don't want to be too pessimistic. I think there are ways forward. Clearly, the Doha round, as I said, kind of ran into the wall. Um, but and the response to that has been the emergence of these bilateral and regional trade deals. Um, our regional trade deals can be useful if they're done right. <coughs> 
Um, but the problem is that they've threatened to segregate the world into overlapping trading blocks with different rules, which would then find it more difficult to get together. And the virtue of the multilateral system was that everybody was playing by the same rule book. If you now have lots of different blocks, it's going to be ultimately more difficult to get them to coordinate together. Probably. Another approach is to more pursue more limited pacts uh, that may include many WTO members. Uh, one good example recently is the Trade Facilitation Agreement which was reached in December 2013, in which all the WTO members agreed to improve the, the, the way their customs departments operate, to move to an electronic basis for pre-clearing uh, a lot of trade, including services, um, at, through border crossings, ports, and so on. Um, under that agreement, less developed countries are going to receive more technical expertise to help them upgrade their trading systems. Uh, and another thing that was done in this sort of area, just specifying one particular area, is that somehow they managed to agree that anything in the solar energy area would achieve or would be um, virtually tariff free. So wind turbines, solar panels. So, so in narrow areas, uh, there may be victories uh, that we can we can score. Um, I don't know how often you know, those are those are goods rather than services. But I mean, Hong Kong just needs to, to try to find areas where those kinds of things can be applied in the service area. It's not hopeless, but it's certainly going to be uh, sticky going. So I have a question. With, with the permission of the projector, I could just say the question is how that holistic Where do you think it will be 10 years from now? Oh, no, no, I know that. That's what I'm, I'm saying. I, I don't think you can say precisely where we're going to be. We've seen the Doha round carrying on really for 15 years and then ultimately only achieving quite a limited amount. Uh, we could well be in 10 years' time no further forward with the global process, but we would have a number of maybe other bilateral and regional agreements and some of these sector-specific agreements. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. Yes. Oh, it's all. Um, thank you very much. Um, I actually asked the same question um, to our beloved um, Chief Executive of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam, in a fan on the way back to the office. I asked her, um, as the government has long been saying that all oh, FDAs are doing good for Hong Kong, like SIPA and stuff like that. Um, but I told her that um, actually Hong Kong um, does not even manufacture any kind of goods anymore. Um, we're more into the service sector. And I asked her, what does this kind of FDA doing good for Hong Kong? She answered me that, um, well, it could protect our business persons overseas. So, I want to ask you that, um, how does this kind of FTAs are doing good for Hong Kong? Um, in terms of our service sector, maybe our business persons overseas. Thank you. Well, as as I said, um, an FTA is a good is good if it creates a lot of trade between a number of different partners. The danger is that it's done between sort of a small group, like the example I gave you of Australia and New Zealand, where it kept out a, a lot of goods which would have been beneficial for uh, consumers in both countries. So, the, I suppose the, the government challenge is to take into account what will serve the interests of the consumers most and not to get cornered by the producing lobby 
as some lawyers, uh, investment bankers, um, no, and producers uh, in the service area, uh, but to make arrangements which serve the interests of the consumer. I don't think we, I we have somebody here who's on the front line of the negotiations yeah. of one of those FTAs, yeah. Kayla. Sorry, I'm negotiating, we're negotiating an FTA with Hong Kong at the moment, in the Australian yeah. Council General. Australia has been quite ambitious on FTAs, and I was a strong advocate, having been in the Doha round, which was going nowhere for them. Mm. One of the dangers in being left out for Hong Kong is that, for example, Australia already has an FTA with China. Um, until now, 60% of investment into Australia, which has been for 15 years the number one destination for Chinese investment. Now it's the US, so, but Australia's still number two. So in the whole world, in overall terms, Australia's now the number two destination for Chinese investment. It used to be the case that that investment would come through Hong Kong to Australia. But when we negotiate an agreement with China, the best FTA negotiation that China has done China now has better access to Australia than Hong Kong does. So it's not a matter of Hong Kong standing still. If you're not part of the process, you'll be left behind in competitive terms. The downside risks, whilst nobody, especially me, would argue that, that the, the multilateral system isn't better. If you're outside the agreements that are emerging, regional and bilateral, you lose your competitive advantage. So there's very significant and clear downside risk for Hong Kong in, in not being ambitious um, about an FTA agenda in the context of the fact that the Doha round has not moved for 15 years. And in fact, Hong Kong's quite far apart on the FTA. So we've got 23. Um, you've got one with ASEAN, which is a substantial one. I think we're one of your first developed economies that you're doing an FTA with. So I think there's very clear advantages for Hong Kong in negotiating ambitious FTAs to, to lock in its advantages, including the advantage that it presents to the world as being a conduit for engagement with China, because China's doing them. So does Hong Kong then follow China? China does an FTA, Hong Kong's got to jump in there and say, Me too! Me too! Well, Hong Kong's got so many advantages and it's very open, but it doesn't mean that the access that's given to Hong Kong by others, um, it's the openness of other, com other countries to Hong Kong. So you can be very open yourself, and you're not as open as you might think, by the way, on the services, actually, you're not very. But actually, you, there's downside risk not being engaged. Great, thank you very much. Who was one of them? Yeah. Um, just to, if we could move the conversation kind of to Brexit and uh, <laughs> maybe perhaps as a more in your wheelhouse. Um, how do you rate Mark Carney's performance uh, oh. with respect to Brexit? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, in general, I think Mark Carney has had a lucky uh, career. Um, he, he inherited a very strong Canadian banking system, which was put in place by the Office of Financial Supervision in Canada. And that effectively prevented any Canadian banks from going bankrupt. Uh, in Canada, supervision is separate from the, the central bank. And so he had no role in that. He'd had, he'd had other roles in finance, but he wasn't specifically involved in that, to, to my knowledge. Um, he then moved to the UK, and I think uh, he inherited situation where <coughs> Mervyn King had done a very good job. Initially, Mervyn King's reaction to the crisis was the wrong one. He was very uh, concerned about moral hazard. But when he understood what was really happening, he then turned on the taps and did QE in the right way. And, and um, like the Fed, uh, the Bank of England and the Fed 
enabled a recovery in the UK. So again, the hard work was done. And Carney inherited an economy which was already growing quite well. He was obviously he was appointed by George Osborne, and Osborne uh, was a very strong Remainer. Um, and I think that Carney, perhaps in the eyes of the public, blotted his copybook a little bit by going along too much with the government view, you know, that uh, Brexit would be a disaster. And he's had to kind of wind back on that. Um, because the economy has actually continued to grow uh, reasonably well, considering all the uncertainty. Um, so really things are, are not the sort of cliff edge or disaster that have been painted. Um, he's made other errors in the area of uh, forward guidance. Um, he's made a number of predictions which have been basically overtaken by events very quickly. Um, and they're pretty. So we often, he's often referred to in the markets um, as the unreliable boyfriend. <laughs> <coughs> I think I've said enough. <laughs> Simon, yeah. That's the microphone. Okay. Um, John, did you declare your role on the shadow FPC on that one? <laughs> no, I, I, no I've, got, I've got a, a quantitative and a qualitative question for you. So the quantitative one's quite an easy one. If you were to strip out tourism from the UK service balance, yeah. my guess is that actually um, you would actually see an even bigger service, this service, which is in the areas where it's probably the, the biggest barrier straight. Is that, is that a correct assumption? And then the qualitative Give question. Give me a chance to look up the figures, because I, 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 I do have them here. Mm. Yeah. All right, well, I'll, I'll get my second question while you have The qualitative one is... Uh, okay, sure, I can give it to you right away. Okay. Yes. The, um, the travel deficit is huge. Um, it's, it's about 10 billion pounds sterling. Uh, that was in 2015. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, the, right. The services are in, the big service services are in professional business services, um, small service and digital services, and in creative services. So, and financial services? Well, that's not included. This is not non financial services. But financial services I showed you in the chart. So, those will be the areas one would have thought that the EU is going to be the most protection stuff. Perhaps, yeah. 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 Okay, my, my qualitative question is, um, you didn't mention the role of um, state subsidised credit. You mentioned solar panels, for example. Um, you know, Donald Trump, one thing that I probably think he has got right is that the WTO, when it comes to state enterprises, state-related uh, provision of credit, is unfit for purposes. So have you got any comments on on that area, uh, because obviously that's China's big elephant in the room. Well, I haven't read the agreements that China signed up to in 2001 when it became a member of the WTO. But my understanding is that they would move the economy towards a more market-oriented basis. And clearly, that process has been stalled for a long time now. And you know, state subsidies, state ownership, you know, all these things are anathema. In many major Western economies, and they're not part of the framework for going forward. I suppose that China's plea is probably, you know, well, we're a poor, impoverished country, you know, and you know, you shouldn't be, shouldn't be um, ganging up on us. But you know, at some point, as I hinted earlier, you know, I think that these confrontations are going to escalate. Um, not just in the area of space up I don't know, maybe we could have an Australian comment on that. Okay. We've been complaining about European Yeah. Yeah. But again, this is Producers' interests, not yes. Producers' so interests. Uh, one more question. Yes, sir. Or, or, or. One, one there, one there. Okay, well, Rob, we know you're going to ask about light bulbs, so I'm going to get mine in. One, but 
producers, producers' interest winning out over consumers' interest, the perennial problem. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I did have some people say you're going to see John Greenwood tonight. You have to ask him and what he thinks uh, about cryptocurrencies. So I will get that in as the lead in and get that. And, but also, uh, when it comes to trade, and trade in services in particular, I mean, the only way, you know, a lot of the services are hard for governments to track. The only way to get them is when you get paid. Um, so, I mean, if people are turning to cryptocurrencies when they're delivering services overseas, you know, as you talk about a lot of it, because you can do it remotely now, you can do it through Skype, uh, you know, just moving documents back and forth. You know, we, I, in my business, we hire tons of people I've never met before. Many of them have never even had a phone conversation, but they get the job done, they get paid. But if cryptocurrencies, you know, become more common as, a, as an actual form of payment, governments are going to find it increasingly difficult to track those payments. Uh, you know, which affects their ability to tax, and I mean, is this another reason they're going to try to do, do their best, if, even if they're not able very well, to stop cross-border services delivery? So first of all, what do you think of cryptocurrencies generally, and what do you think your impact will be on the ability of the government to track it, and therefore tax it? Um, well, cryptocurrencies as money are not meeting any of the basic criteria, uh, in my view. So, you can only buy a limited number of things with cryptocurrencies at the moment. So they're not, by any means, a generalized medium of exchange, number one. As a store of value, they're obviously highly volatile. And as a unit of account, you know, please show me some company that has drawn its accounts up in Bitcoins. Um, so, from that, that standpoint, you know, it, it's, it's a highly interesting sort of area, but it's not fulfilling the key roles that a currency that historically would fulfill. In addition, although it has this blockchain technology behind it, um, that is proving to be very cumbersome and very uh, expensive for each transaction. My understanding is that you, know, if you buy a four or five dollar cup of coffee, it costs you the same if you pay in Bitcoin to actually you know, get the transaction done. The electricity consumption involved in the mining is huge. <clears throat> and furthermore, this is really the key point for central banks, um, it's not scalable. Today, if you look at the interbank clearing systems, RTGS that we use in Hong Kong, or the systems they use in, in, in London, or New York, or Zurich, or Frankfurt, or wherever. You, know, you see billions or trillions of uh, units of currency traded every day <coughs> with really no difficulty at all. We, if, every current, if every transaction <coughs> in Bitcoin has to be scrutinized by this process, uh, there's no way that it's going to be able to compete as a you know, active transaction medium for the vast majority of people for most transactions. And furthermore, because exchanges have been subject to such a lot of hacking and there is no protection, it would not surprise me at all to see central banks uh, take much greater measures to outlaw it. Um, now, I have some sympathy you know, with the sort of fundamental free market idea that you know, it would be nice to have currencies that weren't managed by uh, central banks. But you've got to have a mechanism you know, that manages both but those three things I said, that provides something that is of stable value, can be widely traded, uh, and can be recognized as a unit of measure right, across a lot of different spheres. And I don't think that at the moment these things are, or these cryptocurrencies are living up to that, to those criteria. Um, I may be wrong, I may be very uh, kind of stuck in the mud here, but that's my view. Um, and I will, maybe the technology will move ahead by leaps and bounds. Uh, but that's not written into the system. I mean, the, the, the system requires you know, all this checking in order precisely to kind of conceal uh, 
the ownership and so on. And again, the tax authorities, the, the banking authorities, are not going to be happy with that type of arrangement. So I, 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 I'm, I'm skeptical that these things have a long life ahead of them. There's one more here. One more. Um, I've got a question about Brexit. Uh, yeah. about the laptop. Um, you, you mentioned that generally um, producers were probably not in favour of Brexit and probably want more rules, regulations and restrictions on free trade, really, really by setting standards. Um, I, I went to a talk uh, a while ago by the new dean of law at University College London and he helped Gina Miller frame the question for our 15 group day in panic in that case um, to try to stop it. And most of the universities are against Brexit. Um, at the UCL talk, um, the provost uh, apologised for Brexit. Um, the LSE, who I'm also a graduate from, also apologises for Brexit. Um, most of the MPs in Parliament, supposed to represent the people, actually are against um, Brexit happening as well. Um, but yet the people voted out, right? Um, so my question is, is Brexit actually really going to happen? And if it does happen, what format is it going to take? I ask that because David Cameron said this is a once in a lifetime vote. It's either in or out. And if you vote out the following day, I will go to Brussels and I will launch Article 50 and I won't resign. Now he relegated on all, all those. A, he resigned. B, he didn't go to Brussels and launch Article 50. And then C, his reason for resignation was that, hey, Anne has played a prominent role in Remain, and it would be wrong for me to, to be Prime Minister. So you then get Prime Minister, Theresa May, who is also a prominent Remain person. And you've got a look at Boris Johnson, his time at Oxford, again, pretty much Remain, his time at the Mayor, pretty much Remain. And it appears that there's a game being played out here where you have people pretending to want to leave but actually want to remain. And so you play both sides. Um, so is it ever going to happen? And if it does happen, what format is it going to take? I don't think there's any going back. I mean, uh, it may well be that a, a significant part of the government is, and the cabinet is against it in their heart of hearts, but they're committed to it. And <clears throat> if they even if they even if they don't get an agreement uh, uh, initially they will get some sort of uh, staging agreement uh, preliminary agreement which will set the heads of agreement for the next stage um, and I, I mean it's going to be a take it or leave it issue for parliament and I, I find it very hard to think that parliament will vote it down because we, we won't be in a position to reverse all that negotiation and say, well, actually, you know, we, we really didn't want to do this in the first place. So I, I just don't see that happening. So I, I think it will happen. Um, my personal view is that it will be uncomfortable for a few, for a few years, but that outside of the EU, Britain uh, has many uh, possible advantages. Um, the UK has a much more flexible labour market than the rest of Europe. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we had such big immigration. Now, the immigration led to the concerns about housing, education, health, uh, which caused the popular vote in favour of Brexit, in my view. Um, but that's kind of history now. Um, what people were instinctively saying was, well, you know, if we can't control this flood, then you know, let's get out of it and let's control our own affairs. Take back control is the way that's summarized in British politics today. Um, and th that feeling is pretty strong. I don't think that that will go away. Um, I think that uh, the scope for doing uh, deals with other countries is, is not huge, but, it, but it's there. And 
as we've seen with re a recent decision by the Bank of England to say <clears throat> after Brexit we will be open to all financial institutions. Um, in other words, they're, they're taking a non-protectionist or pro-free market view that they will allow anybody to operate in the UK just because they have to be a European bank. Britain is not going to discriminate against them. Um, I think that that fundamental sort of free trade approach or, or that attitude is consistent with consumer sovereignty. Uh, it's not protecting British producers of financial services. And I think that that attitude, if it can be replicated in other areas, will serve Britain pretty well. Now, obviously there are some sectors where there could be significant short-term disruptions. But the thing about these international agreements is the uh, the, the non-discrimination clauses make it difficult for the EU to be too discriminatory against the UK. Uh, so I'm, I'm not by any means too negative. You can make the extreme case, which um, friends of mine like Patrick Minford and Cardiff have made, that is that if Britain took a really strong free market line, we could again buy most of our a lot of our agricultural influence from places like Canada, the US, um, South America. We wouldn't have to protect um, French farmers, Italian farmers, um, German beet growers and so on, and pay all those fees. We, and that would, we'd buy a lot from Australia, New Zealand again, and so on and so on. All of that would drop the price of food in the UK by something of the order of 6 or 8%. Now that's a very material improvement in the standard of living, particularly for poorer people. They would be the major beneficiaries of that. Now unfortunately I think that the British government has been captured by you know, the farmers who have said, no, 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 we want to keep the current subsidy system and we're starting to see uh, the uh, Ministry of uh, whatever they call themselves now, agriculture saying, you know, we will preserve the subsidies and we will, you know, maintain the current system. Now they could be doing that as a negotiating ploy, but actually it would be, I mean, there's absolutely no reason for Britain to pay uh, protective prices for oranges. In the last few years, the EU has raised the price of oranges no less than five times. And coffee is protected. Why? Not because of because Europe grows coffee beans, it doesn't. But there are German coffee bean roasters who are being protected. I mean, you know, the EU is absurdly protectionist. Um, if you go to Britain and you look at look at the cars on the streets, you know, it's all German cars, French cars, Italian cars, you know, one or two others. But mostly that's because of the ten percent. Uh, tariffs that Japanese, Korean, and other cars have to pay, and the rules of origin. So again, it's highly protectionist. So I think that you know, viewed in the long run, we've got used to, and we've been in the system for 44 years now, and so people have got used to the status quo. They can't imagine a different world, a world of different prices. That's the problem. But if, if those prices were changed, the structure of industry would change, and we would adapt. As I say, we're much more flexible. In the end, I think, uh, bureaucracy will strangle, the Brussels bureaucracy will strangle the EU. Hopefully we'll be exempt from that. Thank you very much. In delivering the vote of thanks, I want to hang on to the phrase that, that John just used, that he's not too negative. And I think that that's probably the best we can hope for um, as we look ahead in the world today. But, but I'm glad we finished on that question and that answer, because um, from a Lion Rock point of view, obviously the Bank of England's approach, which is just let's trade the rest of the world as we are, uh, but also there's another rather deeper thing with, 
the way we think in Lion Rock and promote freedom. Which is exactly your point, that so many people have lived their entire lives in a world of regulation and strangulation by government, that it's extremely difficult to imagine anything else. And if I talk to anyone in Hong Kong about reducing regulation, not having it, they say, yes, but. But we have to have this, because we've always had this. So I think that message that there needs to be a point at which we think about what else is possible, and maybe Britain could be, over the next 10 years, an example, um, forced on the elites by the public, you've got to face what else might be possible, uh, I think is a, is a very good message. Um, now, if I've understood uh, the, the fascinating talk we've had tonight, um, the UK has just exported services to this room in the form of a natural person um, whose dinner has been paid for at the NRC, and I'm not sure at all whether the statistics have captured this services export um, to Hong Kong. Uh, unless, of course, the argument is John is an unnatural person, so I'm sure he's not. But um, we, I think on behalf of the Institute, let, let's, let's thank the UK for this services export which we've enjoyed tonight. Thank you very much, John. As a charity, we can't afford a gift. But you got dinner. <laughs>